Right. Hello everyone, I want to welcome you to this lecture where we're going to be looking at the encryption encryption and decryption mechanism. But before we even go ahead and you know delve into this mechanism, we want to understand just in your in your understanding, what comes to your mind when you hear the word encrypt or encryption? Anyone? Say mic check, talk to us. Mic check. check. This is Chigozi. Yes, Chigozi. Uh, encryption is um, hiding, uh, making a readable form of data into unreadable to an unknown user. Okay, very good keywords and concepts. Thank you. Mic check. Yes, go ahead. Mic check. Yes. It is uh, encryption is a method of, of hiding. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm out of what's a method of hiding or encoding data such that there is a certain trend that you can follow to decode it, not just straightforward to. Uh, to be read. Okay, thank my you. Check. My check, my check. Let me first take on Philly, then I come to you as Aksat. Philly, your hand. Okay, sir. My check. Yes, Philly. Uh, morning. Yeah, uh, when I, the concept of description. Uh, uh, I got to move here. Ellen. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Someone was speaking in the background. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, the process of encryption, uh, this is a process whereby you you hide the data or you, you make the data in a scrambled format so that when it's passing the public internet, the hackers or the attackers, they are, they are unable to detect it. They just see as if it's uh, useless data. But the moment it reaches the other end, they've got also the, the private encryption key, which they use to decrypt the, that information. My check. Okay. Uh, My check. Let me first go to the uh, accent, then I come to you. Uh, 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 then I come to you, the, yes, accent. Yes, sir. So according to me, encryption is a process, just a process of converting the, in technical terms, we could say that it is a process of converting a plain text into a some sort of cipher text using some sort of key that may be a private of a, or a public key. That what is encryption is. Okay, thank you. Uh, Takura, you, you are trying to communicate something. Uh, encryption is the process by which uh, information is converted yeah. into secret code uh, that that hides um, oh. the actual meaning of the of the of, of the message. Uh, for example, uh, cipher text. Thank you. All, all right. Thank you, uh, James. Your hand was up. Then lastly, I'll go with wine. James, your I, hand was up. Mic check. Yeah. Mic check. Encryption is encryption is a form is a format of adding data with a private key. With a private key uh, from the sender, and when it reaches to when it reaches to the recipient, the recipient adds. A, sorry, encryption is a process whereby the information being sent is added with a with a public key encryption. Then reaches the sender, it improvises it improvises with a pub with a public key, which can easily be read by the recipient. Okay, uh, when I will go with when. Lastly, uh, thank you all. Your hands are up. But I'll go with Wayne, then I'll get Najib to tell us what decryption is, and we, we continue with our lecture for today. Wayne, your hand was up. Oh, no, I, I don't want to go through what my, my colleagues have said. The point that I had was, has been covered already. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, Najib, if you could just uh, highlight what uh, decryption means to you, and then we proceed. Uh, decryption is generally a reverse process of encryption 
uh, it encodes the encrypted information so that any authorized user can only decrypt the data. That's how I understand it. Okay, and also Mitwa in the chat said, encryption is the process of translating plain text data into something that appears to be random and meaningless, uh, what is calling ciphertext, whereas decryption to him is a process of converting ciphertext into uh, converting ciphertext back to plain text. Uh, also, Chiyangi says that it is a science of secrecy, converting readable text to unreadable, uh, which uh, will only be made meaningful or only by someone with knowledge of cryptography. Okay, thank you all for sharing. So in this lecture, we want to look at some of the encryption and decryption mechanism. So uh, data encapsulated based on TCP IP protocol stack is transmitted in plain text over the internet, resulting in potential risks. For example, passwords and bank account information may be stolen or even tampered with and user's identity may be impersonated, which defeats the purpose of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, plus controllability and non-repudiation. So after encrypting, after encryption and decryption technologies are applied on the network, transmitted data is protected to reduce the risk of information being leaked. It doesn't mean that it removes it totally, but it helps us to reduce on the risk of information being leaked over our network. So upon completion of this course, you'll be able to describe the development of encryption and decryption technologies, describe the process of various encryption and decryption methods, and also understand the mechanisms of encryption and decryption algorithms. So we want to look at the encryption technology development and then try to understand how it came into play. So we want to look at cryptography and we're saying cryptography is a conversion of plain text. Many of you have been talking about this plain text. So it's a conversion of plain text, uh, which is data to be hidden into cipher text, like many of you have told me, unreadable data. Uh, and it uses a mathematical kind of method. It uses mathematical methods to do that. So you have your P, which is plain text. You add on your key, and then you come up with cipher text. So for us to get cipher text, we shall get, uh, uh, we shall have some kind of formula and this formula will help us, depending on how you interpret it, help us to encrypt and come up with our unreadable text or which you are calling cipher text. So we use this kind of uh, cryptography uh, 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 mechanism to convert our readable data, the data that we want to hide from people who are not supposed to read it into cyber text, cyber text which we are calling unreadable data using some kind of mathematical uh, mechanisms. So, but why should we even encrypt data? What, what is the purpose of encryption technologies? Why should we go through all this process of hiding and you know encryption that, uh, and, and encrypting our data. Like we have said, when we are transmitting our data over TCP IP networks, the data is not necessarily encrypted and people can go ahead and intercept this packet and they can go ahead and you know, cause a lot of damage. Imagine if you're sending your passwords, your bank accounts, your details over, you're signing into your bank account detail, the packet is going to be sent from your computer all the way to the servers of your bank, of your bank, you know? And imagine if those packets could be intercepted and someone reads, oh, this is your account, bank account, oh, you sign in using this username, oh, this is your password. Then someone can sign in from wherever they are and they're able to go ahead and, you know, access your details and access your bank details. And before you know it, you have lost money. Like we said previously, encryption is a process of making information only readable to certain receivers, right? And uh, incomprehensible to other users. When you other users receive it, it will be, you know, H, X, U, T, unreadable text, making a lot of nonsense to them, and they are unable to make sense out of it. But only the intended users or the, you know, will be able to make sense out of that information. So it achieves this by enabling the original content to be shown only after a correct key 
we have now this element which is being put in place. A correct key uh, is uh, used to decrypt the information. So encryption helps us to protect our data from being obtained and read by unauthorized users. Chanika Kira, please mute your microphone. Eh? Here in this class, we keep our microphones muted. Eh? Just like you found the class. So we are saying that encryption helps us to protect data from being obtained and read by unauthorized users. It also helps us to prevent uh, interception and theft of private information over the networks. So encryption guarantees the, conf the confidentiality. It also guarantees the integrity of our data. We looked at these things earlier on. Uh, it also guarantees the authenticity of our data and it is authentic, it is what it's supposed to be, and also uh, helps us to guarantee non-repudiation, that you cannot claim as not the sender, or I'm not the recipient, as far as uh, security is concerned. So with confidentiality, how does encryption help us to, you know, make sure that we, we, we achieve confidentiality? This is in, implemented through data encryption and it allows only users to access and read information making the information incomprehensible to unauthorized users this is the main objective of encryption it ensures that only the people who are supposed to receive the information can read it by using some kind of mathematical equation like the cryptography equation i've, I've shown you before apply the key and then they're able to make sense out of that kind of uh, out of that kind of uh, 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 communication. So that is what we are calling uh, uh, confidentiality. Now, when it comes to integrity, we looked at integrity here. Is it its true form? Is it its original nature? This is also implemented through encryption. When we have encrypted data, we have uh, things like hash algorithms, and we shall be looking at them later on, or even digital signatures, right? to make sure that whoever has received it and has responded back was the correct person. It has not been tampered with. Someone has not masqueraded to be the receiver uh, and they have communicated back or someone has not masqueraded to be the sender. So it, it, it adds a digital signature and also some kind of harsh algorithms. And it ensures that our data is not changed. It is not tampered with, it is not deleted added or even relied, replied by unauthorized users during the storage and also during the transmission of our, uh, of our data. So for the users that require high level security data encryption alone is not enough because data can still be cracked and, and, and changed by unauthorized users. So this is just giving you a higher level of degree of protection, but it does not necessitate that once you use it, you will it, like you have sorted out all the security issues. So you just, when security, you will notice that you can use quite a number of things to achieve one goal of making sure that your CIA triad is in check. So let us look at authenticity. And with authenticity, authenticity, uh, this is implemented through data encryption still. And it, uh, we use uh, hash algorithms or digital signatures. It provides services relevant to authentication of the data uh, by the sender and the receiver. So because they, we are going to exchange our private keys, we're going to exchange our public keys. So these keys, uh, let's say or public to private or pub private to private, it, it will first check and see if this guy has the key and only the people with the key, it is authenticating other people who are allowed to decrypt our kind of information. So we achieve authenticity of our information. And lastly, uh, non-repudiation here. With non-repudiation here, it is implemented through uh, symmetric, we're going to look at it, and asymmetric encryption and digital signature. With the help of trustworthy re registration, or certification organization. It helps us to prevent users from denying things that, you know what, I am not the one who said that, I'm not the one who sent that. Because with this, and through using those different kind of digital signatures, some kind of certificate or digital signature will be attached to the data which is going to be sent. It is coming from so-and-so, and it has gone and it's supposed to be received by so-and-so. So there's, there's no way 
under normal circumstances, you can deny that that packet was not sent from your computer. Either you aided someone or either you were negligent and you left your computer somewhere and someone accessed it and they were able to be to send that packet. So let us look at the encryption technology development. And uh, there has been a <coughs> development of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 uh, of, of encryption and it has been developing over years. And as you can see, uh, one of the first commonly used kinds of encryption was uh, SkyTel. Now with the SkyTel, uh, it, it dates back a, a long, long, long time ago when human beings tried to learn how to communicate while keeping their correspondence, uh, you know, confidential, like the ancient Greeks, Use these kinds of techno techniques, you know, when they 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 used roads that like the sky tail to be there, like it's a piece of you know some kind of they wrap something around it, and this message which is a wrapped around that someone cannot read directly what is in the message, and then the you know it, the the parcel was was now sent to the receiver. So anyone who did not know the diameter of what they used. Uh, uh, in this case, it is like the key cannot understand the information of the message. So they use some kind of wrap and they would wrap the information around it to, you know, uh, with a rod and you only had to know the diameter of the rod to be able to make sense out of that information. Also, uh, there's another kind of, which is uh, called the Caesar cipher. Uh, in, a, in about uh, uh, 50 uh, before Christ, uh, the Roman Emperor Caesar invented a method for encryption for encrypting information during the times of war, which was later called Caesar cipher. The principles were that each letter in this simple text is replaced by a third letter, okay? Further along in the alphabet. And the last three letters in the alphabet are replaced by the first three letters, uh, you know, uh, respectively. So for uh, for example, if we had the word, which word could we use? Romeo. Romeo, okay. <laughs> so for example, well, we... if we wanted to communicate and tell someone that the password is Romeo, instead of writing it like this, for us, we know that we're using the Civa, Cif, you know, Cif, Caesar cipher kind of encryption technology. So we would replace R with which letter? The third letter in the alphabet? C. T. You sure? T is the third letter. C. U. U. Come on, guys. What is your alphabet? Are we having different alphabets? Uh, C for cat. Eh? Uh, uh, other people, we replace it with the third letter in the alphabet, right? Going forward. Do we have. Yes, yes please. Why people shout it, see, because you are saying the third letter in the alphabet. You didn't add to say it's a third letter after the one that has been used in the name. Oh, okay. We replace it with the third letter in the alphabet going forward. Does that make sense? Eh? Because if you are yes. replacing it, now it makes sense. All right, all right, all right. So how about O? Ara. So we have O P Q R. So the R. next letter would be R, right? And with M, P, P, P. P. And with E, P. H, H. And with O, H. R. 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 So they would use uh, they would use this. So instead of using Romeo, someone. Uh, will receive a text like this. For him, he knows that I've used that kind of to encrypt my word Romeo. And I have my letter here. It is U-R-P-H-R. So someone will receive it. Even if someone who is not, you know, meant to receive it will not make sense out of this. He'll be like, hmm, what is this? It doesn't really make sense to me, right? And maybe even if they try to put it in directly, it will not allow them. And thus, thus it could not make a lot of sense to them. So this was the cipher, uh, the Caesar cipher kind of, you know, doing things. So uh, in recent encryption technologies, uh, they were mainly uh, used uh, like the rail face cipher, 
uh, they were mainly used by uh, military purposes, uh, maybe during the war of independence in the US and also in the civil war in the United States and also the two world, war the world wars. So during the war of independence in the US, the rail, the, uh, the, the, the rail fence cipher was used. And in this method, the simple text is written downwards and diagonally on, you know, on successive rails of an imaginary fence. So you have like your different fence. You know how a fence is, right? But then someone has a fence, they know how their characters or letters are supposed to be. There's some kind of imaginary fence and they're able for them to know where which letter goes where because they have some kind of imaginary fence and they're able to you know decrypt that information accordingly. So then moving up when reaching the bottom, and uh, when, when, when we reach the top, the message is written downwards again until the whole plain text is written out, until you go ahead and you know, make sense out of that imaginary text. And that is what was used in, in our, in, in, during the wars. Then we also have the cipher machine. Uh, uh, it has evolved at all the way to the cipher machine. This was very popular during the World, World War I and Germany wrote codes based on a dictionary. For example, uh, like uh, the code of 10 to four to two means that the second word in the fourth paragraph on the 10th page of the dictionary. Does that make sense? So they're saying that the second word, right? The second word here in our fourth paragraph on the 10th page of let's say the Oxford dictionary. So for them, they know you're going to use the Oxford dictionary. Also someone who will have this or even any book, it could be any book. So someone will go and open that book. You have seen this kind of, you know, encryption in movies when someone was, you know, trying to communicate something and people are opening pages of books to find out, okay, this is a code that was used. So this is a second, you know, second word in the fourth, on the fourth paragraph. Uh, or on the 10th page of that kind of book and then they'll go ahead and check in that. So in the World World War, the most well-known cipher machine was the Ingema machine used by Germans to encrypt uh, information. So this is how uh, <laughs> encryption has been developing. So moving forward. Mic check. Yes, please. Hey, Mr. Sandy, uh, yes, though you could take us to the West, but we also have here, I've, I've understood we have Ludicha here in Luganda. It's still mm. the same language, but it's still encrypted. Someone who doesn't know the kind of what you're using does not understand, but others can still understand. So even Africans have encryption. True. They, they had their ways, but in this course, we were focusing on these uh, are commonly known. Uh, and these are some of the technologies that uh, most of the security or cyber security courses focus on. But like there are so many people out there who have their ways or who had their ways of encrypting data, of making sure that the communication is only understandable or read by, by you know, the people who are who are meant to receive that kind of communication. But very, very right, James, thank you for sharing. So encryption and decryption mechanisms. Want to look at some of those mechanisms. So the types of encryption technology. One is symmetric encryption, also known as a shared encryption, shared key encryption technology. So the, asymmet sorry, the symmetric encryption algorithm is also called the traditional cyber Photography or secret key algorithm and one to one key algorithm. Here we're having one key. Uh, it's also called uh, traditional cryptography and uh, cryptography. Sorry, and and it's also uh, sometimes called a shared key kind of encryption. So this encryption can can be calculated using a decryption key, and the sender. Uh, and receiver share the same key. They have the same key and they're going to be transmitting that key over the internet. The sender will send it and then the receiver will also receive it part of the packet that they are receiving. So which is also used for, uh, this key is used for both encryption and decryption. So in symmetric encryption, an effective method of, for encrypting a large, it's an effective method for encrypting a large amount of data. And there are many types of algorithms 
for symmetric key encryptions. We shall look at some of those types later on. So they all have one purpose, namely to transfer the plain text or unencrypted data into cipher text in a reliable or revertible way. The asymmetric key algorithms uses the same key for encryption and decryption. The security depends on whether an authorized user gets hold of that key. So it should be noted that two parties who want to communicate using symmetric key encryption must securely exchange the key before they exchange the encryption data. I have to say and repeat this again. For symmetric kind of encryption, for the two parties which want to communicate, they have to first exchange the key before they exchange the encryption data. This is uh, 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 what we are calling a, a, a symmetric key. So the same key is used for encryption and decryption. And these guys have to first exchange the key before, before they start exchanging, uh, exchanging the encrypted or the data to, which, has, which has been encrypted. So let us look at asymmetric encryption. This one is symmetric. Now we are looking at asymmetric encryption. This one is also referred to as the public key. Uh, uh, it is a form of encryption using a public key plus a private key. We use both these two keys. We use a public key plus a private key that are mathematically related. They're not the same, they're different, but logically related. The public key can be transferred openly between the two parties or even released in the public database. But the private key, however, is confidential and that data encrypted with the public key can be decrypted only by the public by, by the pub private key. And the data encrypted with a private key can be decrypted only by the public key. So it is confidential and it's also not transmitted over the network. So the two different types of keys that are used in this encryption and decryption, asymmetric uh, encryption, and the private key is for data protection. The public key is used by users in the same system to check the validity of the information and its sender. So what is the role of the public key in asymmetric? It is used by the users in the same system to check the validity of the information and its sender. Okay, this is a public key of this guy. He's the one who is sending this information, but we have the private key and now we can use our private key to go ahead and decrypt this kind of information. So let's, let's look at this uh, symmetric flow of encryption and how the data is encrypted over symmetric. So we have a client A here, Romeo, who wants to uh, who wants to communicate to uh, Aksat. Aksat, your hand is up. Yes, sir. I have a query regarding that symmetry thing. So if someone can interrupt in between and get the encrypted mission uh, message, isn't it possible for him to get the public key also if it is shared through that via that simple mode only? Uh, for a symmetric key, a symmetric, the public key is also transmitted and yes, it can be intercepted. And we're going to look at it eh, and look at some of the disadvantages eh, of, uh, of, 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 of the public key being shared as well. Eh? We are going to look at that later on. Okay, okay, sir. All right. So we have our assetment a symmetric key or which we are calling the private key and this key as you can notice is being shared over the internet so user a here and b negotiate for a symmetric key in advance for this private key in advance and the encryption and decryption process starts or is as you have see uh, as you can see here so this guy wants to send this plain text over the you know to b and he goes ahead and before encryption, the first negotiate for the key. And after getting the key, he goes ahead and encrypts the data using this key into our cipher text that is unreadable to other people who are not intended. And when this client here wants to you know, decrypt it and after receiving this encrypted data, he's going to use the same symmetric key here, which they negotiated to go ahead and decrypt this information to finally uh, get uh, our 
plain text or you know information that makes sense to him using the same uh so, sorry, sorry as you I can see your pardon had a glitch i skipped from the when they were negotiating we are saying that uh with symmetric encryption before this guy he wants to send this kind of data to be before he sends it these guys must first start negotiate to they first negotiate a symmetric key in advance they negotiate and be like okay we are going to use this key and a key is just basically a value of long numerical characters eh? could be zero zero one two three four five it's a key they are going to use to decrypt and encrypt that information it's like the key that is going to give them access to that kind of information so they negotiate for the key and be like okay we're going to use this key uh, you're going to decrypt using this key and I'll, uh, I'm, you're going to encrypt using that key and i'll decrypt using that key so this guy as he's sending his data after getting the key he's going to use this key to encrypt the data and then it is turned into our cipher text the data that does not make sense and when b receives that encrypted data he's going to decrypt that data here number five using the same key here that we negotiated and we obtained and then uh, uh the data is now you know decrypted using this key and then it is now in its original plain text that is going to make sense to be that's what we are saying so we are going to see some of the disadvantage because already we are seeing that the key is being transmitted over the network supposedly someone interrupts this key and they get hold of that key isn't there some kind of you know danger or threat to our data we shall come to that later on let us look at a symmetric encryption we said with the symmetric the one we have looked at we have one key that we are using to uh to to, to encrypt and decrypt our data previously with a symmetric encryption we said we have two keys we have a private a public key and we also have a private key and we are going to be using these keys to go ahead and you know uh, to go ahead and, and encrypt our data. So we have our A here and we have our B. And A wants to send this kind of information to, uh, to, to, to B, and to, uh, but they don't want to send it in plain text. They want to encrypt it, but using the asymmetric kind of encryption. So what happens here, A goes ahead and uh, obtains the public key, this guy's public key. So he goes ahead and obtains a public key of, uh, of B in advance. So he knows this is the key. If I want to send to B, I'm going to use his public key. And the encryption and decryption place now, uh, a process now takes place. User A here is going to use B's public, I, public key to encrypt the data and sends the data to B, right? He's going to use this key go ahead, encrypt it with that key, and then sends the data to B. Now, after B receiving this encrypted data, this cipher text, B is going to decrypt the data using the private key and obtains the original. It is only B with his private key, and he's the only one who knows the private key. And it's only this private key which can be uh, used to encrypt or to decrypt this data. But A, used B because everyone on this kind of encryption method has both the private key, uh, which is going to be used to be uh, to, 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 you know, to decrypt data and also the public key, which is used by senders to reference them in the system when they're sending them encrypted data. So uh, this means that it is more secure because the private keys are not transmitted over the network or it's only the public key which is transmitted over the network. But here, we are also seeing another kind of loophole. What if someone intercepts this private key of B and responds to A, and he masquerades to be like that, you know, the, oh, he masquerades to be like A or the sender, and he sends packets, dangerous packets, or must, you know, to B, and B is, goes ahead and, you know, decrypts those packets thinking, this guy is actually the sender, but when he has actually just obtained the private, the public key of, of B. So we are seeing there's already some kind of loophole there. 
and we shall discuss also that in detail. Philly, your hand is up. Yes, sir. Good morning. Uh, sorry for my voice. I wanted to find out, could we relate to this scenario to whereby a bank sends you a one-time PIN, then they tell you to say, you need to change for you to access your account. So you need to change this. And then you create your own new password. That's when you will be able to access. Is it like that? Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily because this one now looks at encrypting data. The other one looks at just an upper layer of making sure that because the one-time pin is an auto-generated pin by the system and, and, and they just want to make sure that it is you who is entirely responsible for the password that you have set by your own. But here we are looking at even how those packets are going to be sent, right? No one is going to send you the one-time pin no one is going to send you anything, but it's the systems which are going to be communicating to either decrypt or encrypt some kind of information. And for you at the end, you're even unaware, or most times you're even not aware of the encryption or the decryption process. For you, you are working on things, but when the data, the packets that we are sending here on Zoom, like Zoom assures us that our you know, audios and the screens we are sharing is encrypted. So I will assume that the data I'm sending over to you from here, my PC, the voice when I'm speaking, once it gets through my, you know, my, my, my layers and goes through, uh, you know, the physical layer, it goes through the application layer that is Zoom, it goes through, you know, the different layers, presentation, session, what, what, transport, like it has been encrypted with uh, my, let's say, uh, 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 because we are part of the same network, uh, our computers, I'm just giving an example, negotiated the public keys already, you have your private keys in Zoom. So once the information goes out there, only the people who are connected to this session with the private key can be able to go ahead and you know decrypt and make sense out of that information. So if someone tapped those packets along the way, they will not be in position to even know what we are talking about, to even know what we are sharing to you, unless when they are also part of this kind of meeting and you know uh, the keys have also been exchanged with them. Uh, Tommy, your hand is up. Tommy, your hand is up. Okay, we shall move forward. So we were talking about uh, symmetric and asymmetric and wanted to see, you know, some of the features. So with symmetric encryption here, uh, it features high chi efficiency, simple algorithms, low system overhead, and it is suitable for, you know, encrypting large amount of data when you're using symmetric. However, it is difficult to implement. Why is it difficult to implement? Because for any kind of encryption to take place, we need to first negotiate the keys which are going to encrypt and decrypt the data. That, that's why it is difficult to implement because these two parties must first exchange their sec keys securely before communicating. It is also difficult to expand because each pair of communicating parties need to negotiate keys and users need to also uh, negotiate keys at the end of the day. When it comes to encryption, the strength, it is first encryption decryption because uh, you already have the key after you have negotiated. So the encryption is faster and also the decryption is also faster. But the weakness is that you have seen already, we are transmitting the keys. And once someone intercepts the key, that private key, which is used, then they can be able to, you know, uh, decrypt that information much as you have encrypted it. So here attackers cannot use one key uh, when it comes to uh, asymmetric. Attackers cannot use uh, one key in a key pair to figure out the other key. And the data encrypted by a public key can only be decrypted by a private key of the same user. However, it takes long time for the public key uh, cryptography to encrypt large amount of data and the encryption packets are too large, thus consuming a lot of bandwidth. Here in uh, asymmetric, we said we use public keys, right? And for you to be able to encrypt data uh, at the end, you need to have your private key. And remember this private key, this public key is generated or exchanged according to this private key. And we said previously that they are different. They are different, they're not the same, though they are logically related, that you need this private key 
to actually decode or decrypt the data that has been encrypted by your public key. And even if someone interrupted the public key, they cannot easily, like we have seen here, they cannot just go ahead and guess or figure out the other private key using the private the public key which they have seen. It will be practically uh, impossible or very hard for them to be able to you know, intercept that. So we are saying that private key cryptography is suitable for encrypting sensitive information such as keys and ident identities to provide high or higher security. So here we have higher security because our private keys are not you know, exchanged over the network and also the encryption and decryption are speed sensitive because you're going to, it takes long and the bandwidth and the large, so it will also consume our bandwidth and it will be, uh, you know, uh, not suitable for applications that have, uh, uh, for applications that have uh, very large amounts of data. So therefore, we also look at some of the things like data encryption, right? We will have looked at symmetric and we have looked at the symmetric. Now I want to look at also data encryption using the digital envelope. Digital envelope. So a digital envelope contains the symmetric key encrypted using the peer's public key. When receiving a digital envelope, the receiver uses its own private key to decrypt the digital envelope and obtains the symmetric key. So we are saying the problem is here with asymmetric. When you're sending the key, it is also not protected. So how about we come up with some kind of envelope mechanism and also this key before we send it, before we send the asymmetric key over the network, why don't we also go ahead and use some kind of asymmetric algorithm and, you know, encrypt it and send it over in, a, in some kind of digital envelope. And then this digital envelope will be now the one used to uh, to, to, to transmit, you know, this envelope. So assume here we have our client A and client B. And client A, uh, user A has the public key of B already. So that encryption and decryption process goes through these phases. So one here, a user uses a symmetric key to encrypt the data, right? It goes ahead like in symmetric, uh, encrypts the data, converts it into cyber text. And a user here uses the public key of the users uh, of, of, of this guy client B to encrypt the symmetric key and generate what we are calling a digital envelope. So we are going to have here our, uh, we are going to have here our symmetric key. The user is going to go ahead and do that. But before they do that, they're going to also get the public envelope of our user B, sorry, they're going to get the public key of user B and they're going to use it to come up with some kind of, you know, public envelope to encrypt our key, which they're going to send. So both the key and both the data is going to be encrypted at the same time. So then user A here will go ahead and send the encrypted uh, or send the digital envelope and the encrypted data to user B. What has happened? We have also encrypted our key into some kind of digital envelope. We have using the uh, user B's public key. And we have also gone ahead and encrypted our data at the same time. So both our key and both our data has been encrypted. So user B uses his own private I, uh, sorry, public pri pa <laughs> private key to decrypt the digital envelope and obtain the asymmetric key, and then uses the asymmetric key to decrypt the data and obtain the original data. So when he gets it, he has his public key, so it's his private key. And remember, it's only him with the private key that can be able to decrypt the data that has been encrypted by his public key. So he's going to go ahead and use this private key and decrypt the data. And after decrypting the data, then he's going to obtain the asymmetric key, now the key which was used to uh, decrypt our information. We said now, because we are mixing some kind of two, we are mixing some kind of symmetric and also asymmetric. Why we want to achieve efficiency 
two, we want to make sure that our encryption is faster, our encryption of data is faster. But with symmetric, we already said we have a challenge that, you know, the keys are transmitted and they're not encrypted over the network. And someone can go ahead and, you know, intercept those keys and they can be able, you know, to steal our information and decrypt our information once they have the keys. Why don't we now use this kind of mechanism to encrypt the key and keep it in some kind of digital envelope, right? And this digital envelope is also encrypted and sent using a metric. And then once it is sent over the network, we generate user A's private key, public key, put it in a digital envelope using that public key. And then only user B can be able to, you know, go ahead and uh, decrypt that public key, get that metric key, and then decrypt the information and boom. Now user B has the plain text and they can make sense out of that data. So the digital envelope has the advantage of both symmetric key uh, cryptography and public key cryptography. And this helps us to speed up the key distribution and encryption while improving key security, efficiency and extensibility. But we have a challenge and it is also still a vulnerability. The digital envelope is still also has some vulnerabilities. An attacker may obtain information from user A, right? May obtain information from user A and uses its own symmetric key to encrypt the forged information, uses the public key of B to encrypt its own symmetric key, and then sends the information to B. And after receiving the information, then B decrypts it and considers the information to be sent from user A. And to address this problem, we come up with another mechanism which we are going to call a digital signature. And we're going to be looking at it later on, ensuring that the received information was sent from the correct sender. We are saying here in this kind of encryption that client A, uh, uh, an attacker, a hacker somewhere here, right? can be able to obtain this information that from A. And after obtaining this information, they'll be like, oh, so we, we can get the public, this is the public IP, this is the public key from B, which has been sent to A. Okay, so let's use this public IP. Also go ahead and also come up with our kind of digital envelope, encrypt the data using his public IP, put the asymmetric key and sends the data. This guy will think that information is coming from A and yet the attacker has taken advantage of the situation. But to ensure that now, this guy is extremely sure that the information is coming from A, it has not intercepted, it has not been masqueraded. He, we use what we call a digital signature and we're going to be looking at it shortly in the next slide. So we can verify data or data verification using the digital signature. Let us look at the digital signature and try to understand there's so many things here uh, on the screen. But basically, the digital signature is generated by the sender by encrypting the digital fingerprint in, into its own private key. So the receiver uses the sender's public key to decrypt the digital signature and obtain the digital uh, uh, fingerprint. So the digital fingerprint, also called information digest, is generated by the sender using a hash algorithm to, uh, you know, on, on, on plain text. And we're going to be looking at those hash algorithms, in plain text information. So the sender sends both the digital fingerprint and plain text to the receiver, who uses the same hash algorithm to calculate the digital fingerprint on the plain text. And if the two fingerprints are the same, then the receiver knows that this information has not been tempered with. So let us assume here we have our, our client A and we have our user B here. So user A uses uh, uses a public IP or the <laughs> public IP, uses a public key of user B to encrypt data. We have his, this is user B. We have negotiated and we get user B's public key. And we're going to use his here, we want to send this text to him. And we're going to use his public IP to encrypt data. Normally, this would be a symmetric info, uh, encryption, right? A symmetric cryptography. That would be it. So we're going to use his public key to encrypt the data here. And we have encrypted our data and we come up with our cipher. Uh, we come up with our cipher text. 
So A is going to perform the hash algorithms or the hash on the plain text and generates a digital footprint, or sorry, a digital fingerprint. So as I'm also encrypting my data here, let me also go ahead and, you know, encrypt further the key or the data that I'm going to trans transmit over the network and I'm going to use a hashed value. And I'm coming up with this hashed value. At the same time, I'm also embedding my digital fingerprint on this hashed value, right? Fingerprint. So I'm also going to go ahead on this step and encrypt that using my private key. This guy is the one who knows his private key. So using his private key, he's going to go ahead and decrypt that information and encrypts it there. And then we have our digital signature that is sent and uh, B now has to receive that kind of information. So what is going to happen after B here receiving that decrypted information when, when <clears throat> so after generating my digital fingerprint and generating the digital signature, I'll send both my cipher text and after sending both my cipher text and digital signature, B will receive it. So when B uses the public key of a user A to decrypt the digital signature, obtain the obtaining the digital fingerprint. So he's going to use pu public key for A because he knows the public A key for A. And remember we said these two keys in a symmetric, they are different, but logically related. That you, as long as you have the public key, you can be able to decrypt because this information has been encrypted using the private key of A. So he's going to go ahead and decrypt using the private key which has been sent to him with E. So a packet received, if the fingerprints are the same and packets are discarded if the fingerprints are different. So he's going to check, okay, I have received this packet and I know uh, A's public key. Let me decrypt and see. So if he decrypts and he finds out that no, Actually, the fingerprint is different. Someone had masqueraded and sent the packet. This is not the, you know, uh, user A's public key. So therefore, he'll go ahead and discard the packets if the fingerprint are different. And if the fingerprints are the same, he'll be like, oh, okay, uh, it means this packet, uh, this guy is the one who last touched it. So I can go ahead and uh, receive it and, you know, go ahead and uh, perform the decryption. And then for after decrypting and getting the user's B's private key, he will decrypt the data. And after decrypting the data, he will go ahead and perform, uh, 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 he will go ahead and, uh, and, and perform the, uh, the hashes on the plain text and generate the digital fingerprint. So uh, this guy here, client B compares the generated fingerprint with the received one. And if the two are different or they're not from the same user, then he will discard. If they are the same, then he will accept it. So this is what we are calling the digital signature. So the digital signature proves, basically its role is to prove, right? That the information is not tampered with and it also verifies that it's coming from this sender's identity, right? It is coming from this sender's identity. So the digital signature and envelope can be now used together. However, the digital signature also has some kind of vulnerability. If the attacker is able to modify the public key of B and user A obtains the modified public key, then the attacker can intercept information from user, from user B to user A. A sign that is forged that information using its own public key and then send the forged information encrypted key to user A's public key to user A and after receiving the encrypted information, user A will decrypt the information and verify that information has not been tampered with. In addition, uh, user A considers the information to be sent by B. So the digital you know, certificate can fix this vulnerability. So if we move from the digital envelope, with the envelope, we also noted that we cannot be able to identify who has sent. If someone intercepts those key much as we have put it in the envelope, the attacker can be able to you know, masquerade and send packets and encrypt data to B. So we said to fix that, let us come up with a way of verifying 
the identity of the sender, we use a digital signature to verify. But we are saying, okay, we may not be able to, you know, because this guy is now somehow securely secure, but I can go ahead and obtain the public key of this guy. And then I will send this public key to A and then A will send the packets to me and then everything. And when I send back, A will think that I'm actually the original sender of the packets. So there's that loophole. And to fix that, now we are going to look at something we're calling a digital certificate to help us also come or to help us fix that vulnerability. Yes, when your hand is up. Oh, you have lowered it. Thank you. So yeah, please, please, thank you. Mm. Thank you for the opportunity. The, uh, 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 allow me just to ask a question on the um, on the envelope. If you can take back the. Yes, please. I'm, I'm just. Uh, Maybe I'm just a bit behind on, on, on what you explained. Uh, you explained that uh, uh, the sender A, when wants to send to B, uh, when he encrypts the, the, the key, it, be, it might be masqueraded by the, the attacker and pretends that he's the one sending the, 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 the encryption of the key. Now I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to relate to a movie that I watched and may, maybe most of us here might have, have watched that movie. It is Prison Break. Michael Scofield was sending a letter in prison to his girlfriend where he told her to say, he, he wrote a love letter, but then he said, remember when I taught you how to make flowers? Then she started to twist the paper and to see the encrypted message. Now, let me relate that to, to the digital envelope. Uh, my question is, suppose I use you, Mr. Sandy, as an example, then the encryption symmetric key is as follows. I, I send you maybe a note, then I tell you to say, remember what I used to correct the name that I used to correct you on uh, during the class, then you know that he, only you can know that he used to correct me about his name when. Then I tell you to say, okay, use that name, then perform the, 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 the Caesar thing of replacing it, uh, the initial letter, you replace it with a third, a third letter in the alphabet. Now, my question is that if I use that as a symmetric key, only you, we will know that, okay, when you used to correct me about his name and not any other person, how is it that another person might masquerade when I've used that, that technique? That's what I wanted to find out. Okay, thank you. Uh, many of your explanations have been explaining actually the digital signature because you are now using my, you have not only used my private key to go ahead and encrypt the envelope, but you have gone ahead and added there a digital signature that only me and you can be able, because only you can be able to intercept or to interpret, right? But with the envelope here, we are saying that I'm going to use your public key to also go ahead and encrypt the, 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 the address. Oh, yeah. You get it? Oh, thank you, bro. You have, you have got the oh, difference no, no. now. Yeah, hi. All right. So moving forward, I want us to move a bit faster. So moving forward, we want to look at the common encryption and decryption algorithms. So these are some of the common ones. We have asymmetric cryptography algorithms. We have stream cipher and we have block cipher. Uh, with stream cipher, we have uh, RC4, which is being one of the most commonly used. And according to crypto, you know, encryption objects, there are two main types of symmetric cryptography, that is a stream cipher and also the block cipher. A stream cipher, uh, basically the stream algorithm uh, continuously inputs elements and generates one output element at a time. Like it keeps on, you know, continuously generating elements, but also outputs one element at a time. And a typical stream algorithm encrypts one byte of plain text at a time and the key input 
is it, is inputted into a pseudo random byte generator to generate apparently random bit stream which is called a key stream and a stream algorithm is generally used for data communication channels browsers or even networks uh, usually for streaming uh, they use this kind of algorithm the common one is rc rc4 and uh, it is designed by Ron Rivest of RSA Security. Uh, I think that was in 1987. And its key is a mainstream cipher of a changeable size. So basically that is it. With block cipher, uh, what happens, like you hear the word block. Uh, we have uh, plain text blocks and keys that are input into encryption algorithm. And the plain text is now divided into two parts. So after being divided into two parts, these parts are now combined into cipher blocks. And after rounds of processing, the input of each round is the output of the preceding round. So the subsequent key is also generated by the key and the type size of, the, of, of a block is 64 bits. So they're also categorized into different kinds of standards. And uh, one of the one of the common common standards is what you're calling the DES, uh, the, the data encryption standard, which was developed by National Institute of Standards and Technology, the NIST. It was a first widely, this guy here, it was a first widely used, uh, um, it was a first widely used, 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 used uh, cryptography algorithm to use the same key for encryption and decryption. It is a block algorithm and it's also 64 bit plain text and 56 bits key are uh, input to generate a 64 bit cipher text. I'll share the material. I'll not really go into the details, but you'll go ahead and read some of those details and try to just understand. So these are some of the algorithms we can use when we are, uh, yeah, when we are uh, 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 decrypting uh, or encrypting information using symmetric cryptography. Uh, so we also have the advanced, uh, we also have the advanced day. I have not uh, talked about it here. Advanced days, which was also used. Uh, we also have the idea, uh, which is the, in the, you know, international data encryption algorithm. Uh, it also uses 64 bits and uh, it is, it is also widely used. Eh? It, it uses a, uh, 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 you know, an input value of uh, 128, you know, bits. We also have uh, triple days, the triple days here uh, also works, but also it goes ahead and adds a, uh, you know, three day kind of algorithm. We have the RC2, RC5, RC6, uh, SM1 and SM, uh, SM4 kind of algorithm. And we also have the advanced encryption standard. Uh, here it uses a 128 bits uh, kind of uh, uh, key uh, to provide sufficient security and takes a less time for processing than longer keys. Uh, to date, the advanced you know encryption standard does not have any serious weaknesses, and uh, it can also still be used to date and many people are also using it. So these are some of the different kind of uh, algorithms that you can use uh, to encrypt or encrypt data as far as asymmetric cryptography is concerned. We have two categories, stream cipher having RC4 and block cipher having these guys here, which we have briefly talked about. I'll share the material, you'll go ahead and read further. When it comes to Asymmetric cryptography algorithms, we can use these kinds of algorithms to be able to, uh, to, to, you know, to encrypt and decrypt our data. So algorithms are used, uh, commonly used in public key cryptography, uh, including the DH, including the RSA, and also uh, including the DSA. DSA stands for digital signature algorithm. R RSA stands for, uh, there are guys who, came up with it and decided to name it after themselves, like Ron uh, Rivest, Adi Sma, and then also uh, 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 and, and then also the DH, which was Diffie Hellman, who came up with that. So basically the DH algorithm is used uh, by two parties involved to negotiate a symmetric key 
same key as used by encryption and decryption. In essence, the two parties share some common parameters and generate their respective keys, which are the same key according to mathematical principles. This key is not uh, transmitted over links, but the parameters exchanged may be transmitted over the link, that is a DH. When it comes to the RSA, algorithms are, uh, uh, and, and named after these guys who jointly developed it at the Muscute uh, MIT. And uh, uh, it is currently the most influential public key cryptography algorithm. And it can resist all known password attacks and has been recommended by ISO and as the public key data, data encryption standard. In addition, it was the first algorithm that can be used for both encryption and digital signature. We also have the DSA and um, it is a variant uh, by some scholars uh, who decided to come up with uh, this signature algorithm. Uh, it was also used by uh, NIST as the digital signature standards. It plays an important role in ensuring that data integrity, privacy, and non-repudiation is achieved. It is based on a discrete algorithm problems in, a, uh, you know, in delivering the same level of security, such as uh, RSA. Uh, DSA, digital signature and authentication. The sender uses his or her own private key to send the file or message. And after receiving the message, the receiver uses a private key of the sender to verify the authenticity or the authenticity of the signature. So DSA is only an algorithm. Whereas compared to RSA, this guy here, a DSA cannot be used for encryption, decryption, or key exchange. It's only used for signature or the digital signature, and it's much faster than RSA in this regard. So commonly used public key cryptography algorithms include the DH, like we have said, uh, includes the RSA, and also includes the DSA. These are some of the common, common, common algorithms as far as uh, public key cryptography is concerned. Now, we are talking about hashes, hashes, hash what? Let us look at uh, the hash algorithms. So hash algorithm here, we are saying that it converts the input of any length into the output of a fixed length, right? It converts the input of any length into uh, the output of a fixed length. This is what we are calling a hash algorithm. And the common hash algorithms, we have a message digest algorithm five, MD5, we have secure hash algorithm, SHA, and we have the senior middle three, SM3. The digital uh, digest algorithm five is a hash function used in a variety of security applications to check message integrity. Developers, uh, most of main, mainly database administrators have commonly come across this kind of uh, encryption. Uh, or hashing values. So it is a function used in a variety of security applications to check message integrity. It also calculates data as another fixed length value and it can compress large volume information into a confidential format before the information is you know, signed by a digital signature software with a private key. So it can also be used for secure access authentication. This is what we are calling the MD5. Uh, when it comes to SHA uh, algorithm, uh, here the SHA is applicable to the digital signature algorithm defined in the digital signature standard. Uh, this uh, secure hash algorithm was developed by NIST and uh, it's a revision of SHA and was published, I think, around 1994. Uh, uh, what it does, it's slower but more secure than MD5. And also it generates a long signature preventing key cracking and also discovers a shared key efficiently. They also go in ahead. It has been developed in SHA-1, uh, SHA-2, uh, 3, and uh, 2 is a more advanced version of SHA-1. And uh, 2 has a longer key than SHA-1 and therefore is also more secure. Also SHA-2 uh, uh, uses uh, SHA256, 38. Those are all different levels of bits. It uses 256, 384 bits, and also 512 bit keys, respectively. Now, MSM3, or the senior middle, 
is a commercial algorithm that was compiled by Chinese National Password Administration. This is for China. Uh, it was compiled by Chinese National uh, Password Administration and it is used to verify the digital signature, generate verify uh, message authentication codes and also generate random numbers. It can meet the security requirements for multiple password applications. Basically, mainly focuses on passwords and these algorithms that I've talked about the MD5, the SHA-123, and the Senior Middle 3 uh, 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 have some strength and weaknesses. For example, MD5 is faster than SHA-1, right? This guy is faster as compared to SHA-1, but less secure because SHA-1 has more different layers. So this guy is more secure as compared to MD5. And SM3 has a longer key value than SHA-1, uh, making them more difficult to crack. And therefore, this guy is also more secure as compared to uh, SHA-1. Which of the following items are symmetric cryptography algorithms? Which of the following items are symmetric uh, cryptography algorithms who was attentive, who was attentive. Which of the following items are symmetric? Check my, it's my yes, check yes, C Alex. and D. C and D, very well. C it is and C. D. I... Very good, very good, very good. And if I said which of the following values are asymmetric cryptography, what would you choose? A and B. A B. and B, okay. All right. Okay, okay, okay. So question two, which of the following algorithms is used by the digital envelopes? Which of the following algorithms is used by the digital envelopes? I check. Yes, Daniel? Uh, B. B, good. Yes. Anyone else? Just a, just, a, uh, just, a hint, just a hint, remember with a digital envelope, we are using uh, two yes. things. Mic check. It's a symmetric. A symmetric. Mic check. Yes, Wanda. Yes, someone is saying mic check. Yeah, I think it's C. Sir. You think it's C? Yeah, sure. Sir. It's B. BMC. It's B. It's B, a symmetric BMC. cryptography. Someone is saying B and C. Mic check. Mic check. Yes, James. It's B. Uh, Mr. Sandy, uh, this is James. Now, yes, James. I'm still wondering, because with the digital envelope, we use both the symmetric and the asymmetric. We still send a key, but after encrypting it. So please throw more light. And that is it. We said with the digital the envelope, question, uh... we are going to use asymmetric cryptography, but we are going to encrypt it around the digital envelope using the asymmetric cryptography, right? That's what we say. I think the question is broader there. Which of the following algorithms? Yes. So the answer leads to symmetric and asymmetric. We use both these algorithms. Let me just take you back to that slide briefly. Uh, let me see here. Digital envelope. Why is my... Uh, Okay, digital envelope. You are saying we are using the symmetric key, right? And it's what, you actually, it's what is actually decrypting and encrypting our data. But because we want it to be secure, we're also going to use asymmetric to encrypt our key into a, some kind of digital envelope, right? That's why we have public keys and private keys. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, Mike. Yes, please. Um, so uh, in, in the digital envelope, it's actually the user A that generates for the user B his, his private key and then encrypts it using the symmetric key so that he can decrypt and find out the private key, decrypt the actual information. Uh, I don't get that right. No one, no one generates the private key for each host. Every host has its own private key. But host client A here will negotiate with B and we'll find out B's public key. Right? And we said these 
are different, but logically related. And you can use the public key, you use or you only use the private key of this host to be able to encrypt the data of that public key. That has been encrypted by that public key. So this guy has both the public key and the private key. So when this guy wants to communicate with this guy, he's going to go ahead and negotiate and get B's public key. I know this is B's public key. And he's going to now encrypt the envelope or you know, symmetric key into an envelope using B's public key. So when it goes to C, C doesn't have the public key of B to decrypt this packet. So C will discard it. When it goes to B, B knows his public key. So you'll be able to decrypt his key, to decrypt this, and then he'll be able to access the symmetric key which was used, which is faster, and also which can be used to decrypt large amounts of data and decrypt this cipher text into plain text which can be readable to him. So we have used both symmetric key algorithms and we have also used a symmetric key to use public keys and private keys. Does that, I hope that explains it. Well, yes, I've got it. Okay. Wait, 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 what have I done? All right, so uh, that brings us to uh, the end of the, this course, this particular chapter, we have looked at this and we said on this question here, our answer here is symmetric and uh, symmetric. And what are the key differences between symmetric and asymmetric? We have looked at them here. We have also talked about briefly the digital envelopes, the problems of uh, digital signatures and how to solve them. And we have looked at the common symmetric cryptography algorithms. We have also looked at the common asymmetric cryptography algorithms and what are the common hash algorithms. So thank you so much uh, for being part of this uh, particular chapter and I'll stop the recording from here.